Good morning. Thank you so much, all the children and parents, this family that sang this beautiful song. To place a scripture in the mind is really to build for the future. And it's one of the most important things for the development of the intellect. And uh, we'll be talking about that later. But uh, if we do that, the effects, the results will tell, even if we don't see it all the time. Thank you, Christopher, too, for the story. Learning from life experience is very important. And that was a lesson that uh, our older dog could not learn anymore because she had too much freedom. And uh, sometimes we make this mistake. I know better how to raise children than to raise dogs. I'm not too good in training them. But, uh, and that was the, re the reason why Bellinia didn't survive, because I was sorry, you know, these things ab about putting an electric collar on the dog, really, I didn't like that idea, but um, I had to learn that some suffering was required for the development of the dog's brain, too, in their bodies, because if she didn't have the chance to grow, right? Today, I'm glad to inform that our dog, the other dog, the sister, Bellinha, she doesn't need a collar anymore. And not just that, our gates, we can go, home, we can go out and leave our gates wide open, and Bellinha doesn't leave the property. She learned really well. Took her some time, I should say, and some pain. And from time to time, she would test it again, see if it was working. And she promptly returned back when she saw it was working. <laughs> so the kids do the same thing. They test our limits to see if we are still serious about what we say. And sometimes we let the color go to quickly. You know, we let them go a little further, and that makes even harder to learn. Um, it is a law of the mind that what they are sure they won't have, they put away from their mind. The spirit of prophecy talks about that. And the scientists learned that too. How did they learn? There was a famous experiment. It was called Pavlov, the man that did the experiment. And I bet many of you have heard about it. It was with dogs, too. And he would do that. He would inflict some pain in the dogs, some electric shock on the dogs. And the dogs would know not to go to that place. But they would, before they would, they made a different thing. They just sound a, a little sound. And whenever that sound came, some food came. Oh, so just after the food came, and the dogs were happy about it, pretty soon they understood that that little bell meant food. So they heard the bell, and you know what happened to them? They start salivating. That's exactly it. They were ready for the food that they knew it was coming. But for them to learn that, every time the bell rang, they had to get what? Food. Bell rang, food, and they learned it pretty quick. But they learned something else. If after the dog learned, they would not give food all the time, it was intermittent reward, the, log, the dog would really, really learn that. Because even if it didn't come, he had hope that it would come later. And it was the same thing when they did for bad things, for the shock. So this thought, thought is a very important lesson, that we are supposed to be firm. When we tell something to our children, they should know that that is like the law of God. It has sure results. You know, if it comes, then, but the opposite is true too. If we say no, but sometimes we let them do, sometimes we don't, but sometimes we do. 
You know what happens? They have hope. So when we say no, they keep on insisting and asking and asking and asking again because they know that maybe sometime it will come. So consistent is very important. But I would like, with this introduction, I would like to uh, read with you something that is in Luke 1. If you have your Bibles, you can open in the book of Luke, the doctor, chapter 1, verse 17. This is the angel talking. Wow, when an angel talks, we should listen, shouldn't we? It must be important. And which angel is this one? That's right. And who is Gabriel? A very important angel. Is the angel that is in heaven, close to God. He took the place of Lucifer that decided that he wanted more, and he got less because he left the side of the Lord. But this angel came with a very special message. Oh, sure, it was a special message because it was coming from the main angel in heaven, and it was coming straight from God. So we better listen. He came and he told a man that was inside the sanctuary. Oh, he was in church. Good place to find an angel, right? He was there praying and interceding for the people, praying for others too. When the angel came and told him, gave him some very good news. The man was Zacharias. And the message was that he was going to get a gift. What gift was he going to get? The son. Ah, oh, what a wonderful gift. How many of us had the privilege of having this gift? Let me see the hands. Who had sons and daughters? Oh, many of us, yes. Do you know that you are a gift for your daddy? Yes, you are. A gift from whom? From Jesus to daddy, that's right. Each child is a gift from the Lord. But it's not really a gift that he gives us. He does what? He loans this child to us. And he says, raise them to me. And he gave very specific instructions to how they should, before the baby was even born, how they should take care of their bodies so the baby would be strong. And stre the strength not just in the physical, but in the mind and in the spirit. But then he said, what was the Lord's plan for this child? The Lord has a work and a plan for each one of us. He says that the same way he has prepared for us a place in heaven, a mansion for us in heaven, he has a work, a place and a work prepared for us where? Here. And when a child is born, the Lord has already a plan for this child. So let's see in verse 17, what was the work that the Lord determined for who? What was the name of the boy? Should be John, exactly. And he shall go before him in the spirit. Let's go to verse 16 first. And many of the children of Israel shall he return to the Lord their God. Ah, oh, what a beautiful thing. The work he was supposed to do would return many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. The sad story is, if they had to return, is because of what? They were not close to the Lord. But he had a special call to return the, the people of the Lord that should be very close to him, to return them back to the Lord their God. And how was he supposed to do that? We had seen that in Malachi, if you well remember that. The very end of the Old Testament, God talked about that. And now he's opening the New Testament and preparing, before even Jesus is conceived, he's preparing the way for Jesus. And it says in verse 17, And he shall go before him 
in the spirit and power of Elias. To turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So again, is the confirmation of what we saw during the week in Malachi. That to prepare a people for the Lord, the first thing, to bring them back to the Lord, the first thing is to turn the hearts of the parents to the children. And the children to the parents, as we saw in Malachi. Or, as it says here, uh, the disobe disobedient to the wisdom of the just. That should be synonym of what? Of who? The parents. The wisdom, the just, should be the parents. The wisdom of the just. What a task jo John had. It is not easy, a word. I have been all over the place. And I've seen, I was talking to somebody last night, and I've seen how the Lord is doing this very work today. He's awakening his people, first touch the hearts of the parents and turning it to the children. And then when our hearts, parents, are turned to the children and we give them time, attention, love, correction, example, their hearts turn to us like the sunflowers outside turn to the sun. Isn't that wonderful? But it has to start with whom? With the parents. That's exactly it. And that will prepare not just the parents, but it will prepare whom? The whole people to come back to the Lord. Why? Because when our families are well ordered, they will be an example of what the Lord can do in changing hearts, in molding hearts. It is a promise. But the same, same promise, the Lord spelled very clearly in the Old Testament. And we mentioned that before, but I want to go a little closer to that. Okay, now our hearts are turned to our children. Our children's hearts are turned to us. And what do I do now? That's the first thing. Because only by love is love awakened. That is in the first chapter of the Desire of Ages. So we have to turn our hearts and pour love into our children. And then their love will be awakened. It doesn't matter if they are a baby, they will respond to it. If they are a toddler, if they are a junior, if they are a teenager, it just gets harder and harder, longer and longer. But the Lord can do it, and can do through the parents and their love. So let's go to Deut Deuteronomy uh, 6. So do you children know how to go there? Deuteronomy 6. Even before my children could read, we would open the Bible and I would point to them where we were reading. We would do the same thing with the hymnal. So they would start having an idea how it goes and have the good feeling that they could follow what we were reading. So we don't have even to teach the letters to start teaching them how to read. When they learn to speak clearly and pay attention, they are learning to read. So. Let's go there to uh, Deuteronomy. And God starts in the, talking about the commandments. Isn't that interesting? He had already given the commandments, and now he starts talking about the commandments. Why does he have to talk about that? Commandments are what? A wall, aren't they? The commandments keep us from having freedom, isn't that? It was not the case with Bellinha. <laughs> you know, her freedom with Bella, her freedom was not what she really wanted. 
it shortened her days greatly. So that wall truly was to protect and to keep her alive so she could learn much more. So that's the first thing that the Lord did. He showed his love, he showed his power to the people of Israel, but then he very soon put around them a fence to keep them safe so he could keep on teaching them before they would kill themselves. So now we see. Now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess, possess it. Okay? And second, verse 2 now, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God. So the commandments help us to fear the Lord, to keep all his statutes and commandments, which I command thee that thou, and who? And thy son. And who else? And thy son's son, all the way of thy life. And thy days may be prolonged. Oh, Christopher was inspired by the Holy Spirit to give that story, wasn't he? So not just us, when we keep the commandments of the Lord, when we go to learn what he wants from us, but when we teach our children, we are guaranteeing them long life. And not just them, our third generation, our grandchildren. So when you are tempted to feel that it, the work is too hard, that the baby crying is really bothering, that the child now, you need a break, remember that you are building three generations when you are teaching that one child and make life much easier and long and healthier for that child and your grandchildren and your grand-grandchildren. And there is one thing, this the Lord told me very early on, you know, when sometimes we are tempted to lose our patience and to talk a little less kind to our children. He reminded me one time when I was right in that process that I would see my child doing the same thing to my grandchild. And that scared me. Because I know how much it hurts on the parents and the grandparents. My mom came to visit us and the same things, you know, that she nicely taught me. If I would be teaching my daughter, no, 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 you cannot eat more than one or two cookies because they are, they, it would not be good for you. We had very little when we were growing up, so she had to, it was not for a matter of health, but it was for a ma matter of just having enough. We would buy just a little pack of cookies and eat very sparingly. So now when I was doing that to my child for a matter of health and she knew it, she had to go to the room and cry. Poor girl, she could not have more cookies. <laughs> you know, so it hurts. Imagine if we are dealing with our child in not a very kind way and then they would do that to our grandchildren. So whatever we are setting here, we are building much higher than we think. But let's go on. We are teaching our children and our grandchildren. And here, therefore, then he changed subject. Verse 3, here, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Here and what? Do it. Here only won't help, that it may be well with thee and that he may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers had promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. One what? One Lord. One Halloween. That's plural. Interesting. So we are not going there. But the first thing is to understand that the Lord, that the work, the heaven, the Godhead is working in as one, in unity, right? So we are getting to know God. He's revealing himself to us. So knowing God. And now, and thou, after we know God, first we had the commandments. We are teaching as we learn. Now 
we get to know God. Then what we do? And thou shalt do what? Love the Lord thy God. How? With all thine heart and what? With all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I commanded this day shall be where? In thine heart. Thy word I have hidden my heart. That I what? I might not sin against thee. So it has to be in our heart. You know, I have some young men with me. And uh, Paul and Leo are with us. And... Uh, I'm working with them on this. And sometimes, you know, sometimes, just sometimes, they feel, why do I have to memorize the Bible? Right? And uh, why? So that we won't sin against God. More than that, as we memorize, the Holy Spirit can bring to our memory when Satan comes to attack us or when we are doubting can bring the exact verse that we need. So we have these words in our heart. And now we love the Lord. And verse 7. Now it comes for us parents. And thou shalt do what? Teach them. How? Diligently. Diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when? Thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Yesterday, I had mentioned about talking. Remember the words? I brought you today the, the study that I had mentioned. That the United States had asked to learn how do we have this difference in children when they get to school, even if they get there so early. And I'll give you just the data. The Lord is saying here, first you get to know him, then you, you teach your children, you get to know him, you love him, and now you talk to them. Talk to your children. And here's the difference. Here are the hard data. Um, the difference between the amount of words that different class of families spoke in their homes was astounding. That's the word they use. Children in professionals' homes were exposed to an average of more than 1,500 more spoken words per hour than children in welfare homes. How many more words? 1,500 more words spoken per hour than children in welfare homes. It was not the educational level. And they found out it was not even the, it, it went with the income, but it was not because of the income. Because parents in welfare that spoke to their children, that communicate, that taught them as they woke up, as they walked, as they were sitting down, laying down, those children had the same uh, development as the children in professionals' homes. What a difference. Now, over one year, the amount, that amounted to a difference of nearly 8 million words. And, listen now, which by age 4 amounted to a total gap of 32 million words. They also, it was now, listen, it was not just the amount of words, but the kind of words. And guess what kind of words those children that heard less heard? The, they heard much less. And those words were more words that were negative than the other children. Um, and I'll give you the exact amount. They found out, also found, that in the first four years after birth, the average child from a professional family receives, in the four years, 560 
thousand more instances of encouraging feedback than discouraging feedback. More than a half a million more words of encouragement and positive feedback than words of reprimand, of discouraging. Now, in the, a working class child receives nearly 100,000 more encouraging than discouraging words. Do you see how much a difference? The one received more than half a million more encouraging words. This receives more encouraging words, but how much more? 100,000. And in the welfare child receives 125, just that were more discouraging words than encouraging. And that crushed the child. And that was like acid in the little neurons that they were developing. Instead of growing, these children were what? They were shrinking. Isn't that sad? And that gap is a very hard one to undo. But the Lord, in his kindness and mercy, told us, told us, many years ago, to those not welfare, but slave children, how they could raise good children. And how was it? Let's look again. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. Talk. What are we talking about? The things of the Lord. Are they encouraging words? For sure they are, right? They are talking about the law of love. They are talking about the God of love. Are they encouraging words? We can be talking about don't do it, don't do that. But if we really know the Lord and we love the Lord, we know that really what in every commandment is a what? A promise. So what he's saying is, if you love me, you will not kill. If you love me, you will not commit adultery. If you love me, you will obey, honor your father and your mother. So it is encouraging and it's positive. And it does something else. As we are walking with our children, we are getting to know them better and better. You know, there's an, an interesting uh, book that I'm reading, and I guess that you might have come in contact. It's called Brain Rules. And they have several different studies that talk about the development of children. And uh, in this book, they mention Eric Kendall, that he, shows, he showed that when people learn something, the wiring in their brain changes. Do you know what the wiring in their brain is? They're the connections, the neurons. That's how we think. You know, one neuron connects to the other one that connects to the other one. And then as we think that again, as we see the same thing happening, it becomes like a, a slide, you know? When you trigger the first one, it goes with the whole thought. It can be a good one, it can be a bad one. We see that in addiction. You know, when an addicted, addictive person sees uh, a drug addict, he sees a um, needle, what he thinks about, he thinks about the experience he had, and immediately he starts craving for that. Or if he just, is, if an alcoholic goes in front of a bar, what does he think about? The drinking. So they have many times to be removed for, from their place to be able to overcome their addiction. Because the brain is changing structurally. But listen to that, it's more than that. Uh, acquiring even simple pieces of information involves the physical alteration of the structure of the neurons involved in the process. The neuron itself changes, not just the connection. Taken broadly, these physical changes result in functional organization and 
reorganization of the brain. This is astonishing, says the scientist. This, listen, it changes in the organization and reorganization of the brain. I call that formation of the brain or transformation because here we have the hope that the brain can be reorganized. So you have hope if your child is a little one or if your child is a big one. In my house in our garden, we planted parsley. Who likes parsley here? I love parsley, yes. Cleans the blood, cleans the blood too. You know more than me about all this. But parsley, we were so happy. My son had planted it and it was growing beautifully. And then suddenly, we noticed that it was being eaten. And I said, what is eating them? My son is an observer. He learns by looking in nature and learning from, him, from it. Oh, much better than me. I learned from the books. So if the book says, I'm good with it. If not, I have a hard time seeing patterns. But the Lord was good, and he learns straight from nature. Scientist, I guess. So he was there, and so he started looking for what was eating the parsley. What do you think, children, it was eating the parsley? Huh? Grasshopper. No, it was smaller than grasshopper. Huh? Worms. Yes. No, that's it. It was worms. Little worms like this. And we found some that were a little bigger. But my son didn't stop that. I said, what is this plague coming to my parsley? I love my parsley. I don't want to share with them. <laughs> but my son kept observing. And we took all the worms from there. And uh, some smaller, some bigger. And then one day we were eating. And I was looking outside. Oh, it was so beautiful. Beautiful day. And some butterflies were coming and going in our garden and looking. And I was so happy for the butterflies. And my son looked and said, hmm, I think I know now. So he went outside. He looked underneath the leaf. And guess what he found just after the butterfly went there and squished herself and did some movements. And he obser observed that. And when he went there, what did he find? Yes, some gifts from the butterfly. It was egg gifts. They were so beautiful, little white dots right there underneath the leaf. And uh, then we looked, and there were some little worms. Oh, some butterfly before came and put some little eggs, and the eggs became little wiggly worms. And some worms were smaller, some worms were bigger. They had grown with my parsley. <laughs> That's why they were bigger. So. We decided that we would study those worms. I didn't like them eating my parsley, but I loved the butterflies. It was so beautiful. So you know what we did? We collected the little worms. We scratched off the little eggs. We took the little worms inside with some parsley, but I went to the market to get parsley that was not organic and well planted <laughs> as mine. So I thought, the butterfly can eat those. Not the butterfly, but who? The worms. the worms. So we put it there, and we start feeding those little monsters because they were becoming monsters. They were growing so fast and so big, and they become fat, and they became bigger, and they had some nice colors, but they were not that nice. They were wiggling, and they were... But one day, they stopped doing all that, even stopped eating the parsley. You know what they did? They attached themselves and made a hard shell around them. And inside that shell, I didn't know what was happening. So what do we do? Now I go for, with somebody that has, you know, learned about that. There were some Christian scientists because nobody knew what happened inside that shell. They just know that they go there they stay some time there, very quiet. They stop eating. And when they come, come out, what do we have? A butterfly. a butterfly. So I always thought, mm, some legs of the worm becomes legs of 
the butterfly. The eyes becomes the eyes of the butterfly. The, but you know what? Some Christian scientists were so smart. They sliced, you know, and they checked in several different ages those little cocoons, and they found out that really what happens is most of the worm does what? Melt. Yes, exactly. They became, become a liquid. And then from that soup, it comes a butterfly. Yes, some little things change. They still have their intestines, but their intestines of a big intestine of those worms become little intestines that instead of eating my parsley, come to smell the flowers and eat the nectar and something else. But you know what happens? If we are patient with the difficult worm, if we feed them the time they are growing and eating so much, if we feed them with words, if we feed them with love, if we feed them with the commandments of the Lord, even if it's hard, and sometimes, you know, we think that they are eating our whole life, they are eating my sleep. They are eating my patience away. <laughs> if we is to remember that they will become a butterfly and that will be beautiful and they will fly and they will be the ones that will pollinate the flowers and that they will give more flowers and fruits for the Lord, we'll be more patient with the worms. We will, instead of saying, I don't want to share my time, I don't want to share, you know, I'm in my cell phone now, please be quiet, we will do what? We will feed the little worms. Not with the supermarket, grocery store, you know, parsley, but we might give them the best parsley possible. Because what the little worms eat will interfere in how the butterflies are. Did you know that? Some butterflies, some little worms eat a plant that is poisonous, milkweed. And what happens? After that soup happens, the butterfly that comes out of that it still has that poisonous milkweed. Mm -hmm. So the worm ate some poison, and the butterfly has in its system. Isn't that interesting? Whatever goes in, even if they transform a lot, is still there. We have to remember that. We might think, oh, this is just some cartoon. Oh, this is just some series. Oh, this is just some movies and they know it's not true. But if it's coming, and remember, it's transforming the very structure of the brain. It means what? That it is transforming the child. Even when they become an adult, they still will still have the poison that is there. And those butterflies, by the way, the Lord has a reason why they have that poison in their system is because no birds want to mess with them. They are the monarch butterflies. And nobody wants to get because it tastes nasty. <laughs> and they don't want anything to do with that. And some other butterflies ride in that knowledge and they, are, they imitate the monarch colors so the other birds don't get them either. Yeah, the Lord knows how to do things, doesn't he? So, just I forgot to ask, what's the time to finish? Five minutes ago? Yeah? Okay. So, parents, let's do what the Lord says. It's, it seems hard, but if we think that, usually we think that we need specialists to, to teach the children, that we need them to go to a special place, to have special books, but the Lord gave us everything free. The same way that he gave, gave us health, 
in a free way. He gave us education, free or very cheap. We can teach our children by words. And not just that, if we are walking with them, it means that they are seeing us constantly. And we'll be talking about that later in the next meeting, about the principles of education that comes from God and the power of example to turn minds inside out. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you give us all that we need to raise the children that you have placed in our hands. Please help us not to be selfish with our parsley. Help us not to be selfish with our time, with our patience, with our kindness. Help us to remember that when we do that, we are feeding them for life and eternity. Help us, Lord, to give them wings to fly away closer and closer to you, to feed, to help, to nourish other plants, little plants that will be growing, and to, have, to help them to give fruits, fruits of the Spirit, so that your name will be known everywhere, that your glory will lighten this world, and that you'll be able to come because a people were prepared inside of each home. We ask you these blessings in your company in the rest of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.